Hello everyone and thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Meven Wibon and I'm a coastal engineer at DHI Australia. And today we're going to talk about shoreline protection against erosion. During the previous webinar, we've uh, had a look at the, we've, we've been describing some of the main processes involved in sediment transport. And uh, the idea of today's webinar is to uh, look at uh, how these processes can uh, create erosion along the coast and detail how we can, uh, or some of the methods that can be used to protect our coast against erosion. The previous webinar is still available online. So if you want to have a look at it, uh, you're welcome. And it will probably help you understanding some of the processes. Last time we've had a look at the, at the basics for sediment transport. And, uh, this is today's agenda for uh, for the webinar. So we'll start by uh, trying to classify the or see how we can classify the different uh, the sandy coasts. Then we will look at the different different types of erosion that can affect this coast, and then we will we will detail some of the main measures uh, against erosion, uh, and especially two types of measure. First, uh, the protection um, that are, that consist in uh, hard structures. And the second one, which is a, a soft way of protecting the coast uh, by using nourishments. Basically, when we want to when we want to look at erosion, uh, we try to define what we call a sediment budget, which helps us uh, defining the areas where deposition and erosion occur. Here is an example of a coast where a harbor has been built. And we can see on these satellite images that due to the construction of this harbor, which blocks the sediment transport along the coast, we can see that on the southern end of the breakwaters, there is an accumulation of sand. And north of the harbor, there is erosion. This is due to the fact that the harbor blocks the sediment transport, which was originally oriented towards north. There are many tools that can be used to uh, establish a sediment budget. For instance, satellite images. Uh, when we have a certain number of satellite images spread in time, we can uh, we can have a look at where the coastline has retreated, and um, also we can sometimes relate disease to uh, to uh, developments along the coast. We can also use a bathymetry survey uh, to identify. Uh, accretion and erosion on the seabed and sometimes even uh, information from the authorities on maintenance dredging rates in in the ports or in the navigation channels and finally uh, we can also mention that uh, numerical models can provide a good estimation of the sediment budget but before uh, looking at the erosion itself uh, let's look at the different coastlines that we that we have and and let's try to classify these coastlines. The erosion is not necessarily the same everywhere. And uh, the action of the coastal processes on the geolo geological setting is a, in a specific area will result in the development of different types of coastal profiles and coastlines. There are different ways of classifying the coast. One of them is to classify the coastal profiles based on the wave conditions, the tidal regime, uh, storm conditions, available sediments, or geological conditions in general. Another way of classifying is a an engine, more like an engineering classification of the coastlines, which is uh, which is more based on the on the morphological response of the coast when when we intervene on it. In the end, uh, the classification of the coastlines helps us understanding the the main physical conditions that we are facing and also defines which kind of of shoreline management measures uh, will be potentially applied to protect ag against erosion. One way of classifying the coast is, can be based on the exposure to the to the wave climate. This is a good example. Uh, this satellite picture here is from Cape, Cape Cod in the US. And we can see that uh, these two neighboring beach, which are uh, separated by uh, maybe three or four kilometers, have a completely different visual aspect. And this is mainly due to the exposure of the stretch of coast uh, to the waves. On the east coast, there is a good exposure and we can see that there is a beautiful wide sandy beach. And on the west coast, it's a more uh, protected area. 
and therefore the beach is not as beautiful and we can even see that there is some some vegetation so let's see how we use the uh, wave exposure to classify the coast uh, here at dhi basically we define three types of coasts the exposed coast the mod moderately exposed coast and the protected coast and this is based on the significant wave height which is exceeded uh, 12 hours per year when it's higher than three meters we we classify the coast as uh, exposed when it's between one and three we it's it's defined as moderately exposed. And when it's below one meter, uh, it's uh, defined as protected. Now we will look at some examples where we illustrate uh, this classification. These two pictures here show exposed or moderately exposed littoral coasts where, um, where there are abundant, abundant sediments and a limited supply of uh, fine sediments. So we can recognize again the Cape Cod uh, on the left picture. And we can see that uh, thanks, to the, thanks to the exposure of the coast to the, to the waves, we have a nice, beautiful sandy beach. Typically, the annual uh, gross uh, sediment transport along this kind of coast is between 50,000 and, and can be up to 1 million or even more cubic meters per year. On the right picture, we can see a, a moderately exposed uh, coast where there is still uh, abundant sediments. And we can see that as uh, there are uh, limited action or less action from the waves, the beach is uh, slightly, slightly narrower. And uh, we can even see that there is some, uh, some seaweed that is allowed to, to be deposited because it's not washed away by the waves. Here is a picture of another moderately exposed type of coast, which is uh, typical from the tropical environments where uh, there is a monsoon seasons or uh, heavily swell uh, dominated wave climates. And this type of coast is characterized by persistent wave conditions, which uh, will uh, typically wash away the fine sediments, even though there, there can be some, uh, some abundant uh, supply of fines. Along this kind of coast here, we can see in Sri Lanka, we can uh, have typical uh, annual gross sediment transport of between 1,000 and 500,000 cubic meters per year. So this was for uh, exposed and moderately exposed coasts. Now let's have a look at the protected coasts. This is typically seen in areas in connection with uh, small bodies of water, such as estuaries or, or lagoons or fjords. Uh, it can also occur out of large bodies of water, but require specific conditions such as a very mild climate or very shallow area, which protects the shore against the wave action. Under these conditions, the beach are relatively narrow and sometimes even non-existent. And there is usually uh, an accumulation of fines, uh, which are often supplied from uh, neighboring rivers. This can typically lead to marshy environments in, uh, in temperate climates or uh, in mangrove vegetated uh, er, zones uh, and muddy coasts in uh, more tropical areas. Another type of coast which is worth mentioning is uh, tidal flats, where the tidal processes dominate over the wave processes. They are usually characterized by uh, wide and gentle slopes of the foreshore. And we really often see a, a huge accumulation of fine, fine sediments. In these areas, uh, sediment transport processes are uh, very complicated because of the influence of the tidal currents and waves. And there are also very often both cohesive and non-cohesive sediments that are involved, so it's, uh, it makes it even more complicated to, uh, uh, to understand. Let's finish with uh, coral coasts. This type of coasts normally occur in the tropics, away from uh, supply of sediment, where water is very, very clear, or uh, typically in, um, in arid climates. Due to the presence of a reef uh, in front of the beach, the waves are breaking and the, therefore the wave action on the coast is uh, very limited. And this often lead in, um, in very narrow protected beach and uh, which are difficult to access. It can still be interesting uh, coast for fishermen, for instance, because 
very often some uh, some natural uh, protected location can be used by the by the fishermen to moor their uh, their boats nature cannot be changed uh, so sometimes it's not possible it's simply not possible to have a wide beach in a protected area as we've seen in the in the different pictures before the wave exposure provides good sandy beaches whereas protected beaches develop into muddy uh, beaches with with uh, vegetation the structures along the coast can cause uh, can cause protected areas and uh, enhance the tendency for muddy beaches here is an example in Denmark where there is a breakwater that has been constructed on the on the north of the coast and the area just west of this structure develops in a non-attractive uh, muddy beach. So one idea here to improve this uh, this situation uh, would be to shorten the northern breakwater and give up the idea of having a good beach at the north and then uh, extend slightly the southern breakwater and nourish uh, and nourish the beach in order to reduce the travel distance of the waves to the beach in order to increase the wave exposure and therefore guarantee a, a better beach quality and better sand quality on the beach this requires some some work in order to improve the situation Another way of classifying the sandy coast is uh, based on the coastal response uh, it has to interferences. In that sense, wave direction is also a very important parameter. As we've seen during the previous webinar, you can still uh, consult it online. The longshore sediment transport is dependent on the angle of, in of incidence of the wave energy. So when we have waves arriving uh, normal to the shoreline, the angle is uh, is close to zero, and therefore the longshore sediment transport is also close to zero. Then, when the angle of incidence increases, we have an increase in sediment transport until it reaches about 45 degrees. And if the if the angle of in, of incidence increases more, uh, the the waves will become more and more parallel to the coast and therefore uh, generate less and less sediment transport or longshore sediment transport. And this is a starting point of uh, Q-alpha curves, but I will talk, talk about that a bit later. Depending on the wave direction, we can therefore have a stable or unstable coasts. The A section characterizes uh, stable coastlines which is on the left uh, part of the slide. So in, this, in the typical case of a stable coastline, we have an incident wave that is arriving on the coast with, a, with an angle which is below 45 degrees with the shore normal. Instead of having a straight shoreline, let's imagine we have a small perturbation along the coast. What happens in the stable case on the A part of the curve if the difference between the angle of incidence and the shore normal augments, then the sediment transport augments, which leads in the situation that is described here, where um, on the southern part of the perturbation, the sediment transport is lowered and on the northern part, it's increased. And therefore, this leads to a, to a reduction of the perturbation. Now, if, if we look at the unstable stretch of coast, which is in the B part of the curve, it is the opposite. When the difference between the angle of incidence and the shore normal, and the shore normal augments, we have a decrease in sediment transport, in longshore sediment transport. And it's the opposite as what happens on the stable coast, which means that uh, we will have an increase uh, an increase of sediment transport on the southern part and a, redu a reduction on the northern part. And this will lead to accumulation on the offshore part of this perturbation. So what we have to remember when we look at, at, this, uh, at this curve is, uh, when, is that when the angle of incidence is relatively small, so below 45 degrees more or less, we tend to have stable uh, shorelines. And where uh, we have very oblique waves, it's, uh, usually, it usually leads to, um, to unstable coasts. 
This is an example where we have both situations at the same uh, area. It's a stretch of coast in, uh, in Malaysia, in Pulau Pinang, where we have typically uh, northeast monsoon waves and a very silty water. We can see it's, it's, uh, it's sort of brownish. At this location, on the, there, there's, there have been some nourishment that have been applied along the coast. What we can see on the western part of the picture is that the beach field is uh, completely out of control due to a, a very oblique uh, wave angle. And if we look a bit further uh, to the east, we, have, we can see that we have a natural morphological stable beach uh, due to a more moderate uh, wave angle. And this leads to a good quality of beach, even though the, the water is uh, relatively silty. And this is once again thanks to, uh, to the wave exposure, which, which washes away the fine sediments from the beach. In this kind of situation where the where the nourishment on the western part of the beach is completely out of control we can maybe imagine that uh, a small structure would help uh, stabilizing the the nourishment for instance but this would require some some uh, studies and and design let's get back to the q alpha curves it's a very important tool, so I would I'd, I'd rather spend a bit more time on it. Um, what a Q alpha curve does is relating the the shoreline orientation to uh, to an associated uh, sediment transport, to a net and gross sediment transport. So this can be assessed by calculating for a certain number of of orientation, what would be the sediment transport for a specific wave climate? This is very useful to identify what is the equilibrium orientation of the coast, which is defined when the net transport is zero. It can also be used to assess uh, the lifetime of a nourishment or uh, to estimate the, the accumulation along a structure, for instance. Here is a schematic, a schematic way of summarizing the two main parameters that we've uh, been looking at. So the wave exposure and the angle between the shoreline normal and the wave incidence. And we typically define different uh, coastal types uh, based on these two parameters. I will not detail all of them, but if you want to have more details about uh, these different types of coasts, uh, I suggest that you have a look at the Shoreline Management Guidelines book, which is uh, available on, um, on DHI's webpage. As we have seen in the previous webinar, there are different types of coastal processes which lead to different types of sediment transport, and this can lead to different types of erosion. The acute erosion is typically the flattening of the coastal profile due to offshore directed cross shore sediment transport. And it's uh, usually very episodic, uh, event related type of erosion. On the other hand, we have uh, chronic erosion, which is typically uh, connected to uh, longshore sediment transport and which consist in a general retreat of the entire coastal profile due to a gradient in longshore sediment transport. And then we can also mention intermittent erosion, which is due to fluctuations in wave climate and sediment supply. Let's start with acute erosion. As I've said before, the acute, acute erosion is typically linked to uh, storm events. Basically what happens is, is that during the storm events, uh, we have an erosion of the upper part of a profile, uh, like erosion of the dunes or uh, of the upper part of the beach. And this sand is deposited further offshore in the outer part of the profiles. This causes a flattening of the profile, which, uh, which leads to erosion of the, of the shoreline. What can happen is uh, after a storm uh, or severe storm event, uh, calmer periods will tend to push back the, the sediment uh, to the upper part of the profile. 
in the end, uh, acute erosion and uh, and the subsequent accretion during the calm period is more or less a, a redistribution of the sand in the coastal profile. So it, it doesn't really remove sand from the profile, but it's uh, it's moving it back and forth um, along the cross shore direction. This is illustrated uh, on profiles that have been measured in um, in Australia, where um, on the upper part we have uh, we have a profile that has been measured before and after a storm event. So we can see that um, the sand, all the sand that was located uh, in the red area, has been uh, pushed away in the offshore part of the profile due to uh, due to cross shore uh, offshore directed sediment transport and then during the the following period which was much much more calm so in the in the lower part of the graph we have uh, we can see that the that the sand that was located offshore uh, in the red area has been or some of the sand has been pushed uh, um, towards the upper part of the profile chronic erosion is uh, related to longshore sediment transport and especially to gradients in the longshore sediment transport. This kind of erosion typically affects the entire uh, active profile. One main difference with uh, acute erosion, which is a redistribution of the sand in the profile, is that uh, chronic erosion is usually not reversible. A typical example is uh, in the lee side of, um, of a headland or uh, or a structure, for instance. As we can see here on this sketch, the waves are coming from uh, northeast, and there is a, there is a headland, and south of it there is a, there is a beach. So we have longshore transport which is directed towards south, but the problem is that we have no supply of sand from the upstream location. Therefore, we have a gradient in the longshore transport, which is illustrated by the by the length of the arrow. Very close to the headland, there is uh, very little uh, sediment transport, and the more south we go, the more uh, the larger the sediment transport is, and therefore the the erosion uh, occurs um, close to the close to the headland. Very often during uh, during episodic storms or events, we can have the we can have both erosion occurring at the same time. The cross shore erosion uh, takes the the sediments from the upper part of the profile to the to the outer profile, and at the same time, the longshore currents uh, takes the sediment out of the section. If a, if a shoreline is prone to, to chronic erosion, at some point in time, the shoreline will retreat to a point where the viability of the profile due to acute erosion is unacceptable. And therefore, uh, it's important to have in mind that protecting against chronic erosion may prevent acute erosion becoming a problem. Let's have a look at uh, how we can protect the coast against erosion. But before getting into the different types of protection that can be applied, let's have a look at small definitions. We define different types of protection. First, the, the coast protection, which is, a, which is a measure aiming at protecting the coast against coastline retreat. Then we have the shore protection, which, which is a measure aiming at protecting the coast against erosion but also preserving and restoring the, the shore and the dynamic coastal landscape. Finally, we have another type of protection we, we won't detail today, uh, which is a sea defense and which is a, a measure aiming at protecting the low-lying areas against flooding. The choice of the protection measure depends on, the, on, a, lot of, uh, on a lot of parameters. First, what is the problem? Do we have uh, coast or beach erosion? Uh, do we have flooding? Then another very important, very important parameter is uh, what is the uh, what is the cause of the problem, and that's how that's where uh, coastal processes understanding of the coastal processes becomes very important. 
Then we also, it's important to have in mind what are the, what are the morphological conditions of the cause. So this is typically based on the, on the classification uh, that we've been looking at before. And then we also need to, to assess uh, what, what is going to be the impact of the scheme or the select, selected scheme on the adjacent stretches of coast. It's well known that most of the protection schemes move the problem somewhere else. So we have to think about that when selecting a measure against erosion. What we will do to today is to look at different types of, uh, of measures. So we will uh, distinguish hard structures which consist in constructions on the coast or close to the coast. This type of protections are typically built to prevent against chronic erosion by reducing the, the longshore transport and cause local accumulation. And then we'll have a look at the soft solutions, so typically nourishments, which consist in uh, adding a, an amount of sand along the coast where some sand have been lost by chronic or acute erosion. Let's start with the, with the hard structures and we will start with seawalls. So seawalls are, uh, are by definition passive structures that uh, separate land and water areas. Their role is to uh, fix the location of the coastline. And it's, uh, it's a type of protection which is very often used in, uh, in cities where, where space is very, is very scarce. But one of the main uh, characteristics of these uh, of these seawalls is that they have to prevent uh, erosion against wa very strong wave action and uh, and typically during storms. So uh, it's usually designed to resist to resist very very strong forces. So that's why uh, they can have different shape in order to absorb the the wave energy. One of the benefits of this kind of uh, seawall is that they can be combined with other activities and very often used uh, for promenades in the, in the cities. One of the drawbacks of this uh, seawall is that there is still potentially chronic erosion that occur uh, in the profile, so it, it needs to be monitored and sometimes repaired uh, also when very strong events uh, hit the, the seawall. And due to the fact that uh, it can potentially block part of the part of the active profile, uh, it usually lead to um, or it can potentially lead to downstream erosion as well. Another type of hard structures which are very close to to seawalls but but not exactly the same uh, are um, revetments. So it's a bit the same than than, than seawalls. Uh, they protect against erosion and mainly acute erosion uh, in the foot of a cliff or um, of, of a dike. But the main difference with the seawall is that they are not designed to protect against flooding. Once again, they, ha they can have uh, different shapes to absorb the, the wave energy. And another thing that is, uh, that is important is that they can, uh, they can be buried if they are constructed as part of as a soft protection, including nourishment. By burying the revetment, we typically build an emergency protection uh, into the dunes in case of uh, very, very severe erosion that would be uh, unexpected. Another type of, uh, of structure is, uh, is a groin. Uh, groins have been used a lot uh, in history uh, and in, on a lot of uh, coasts. So let's have a look at, um, at how it works. So by definition, a groin is a straight structure, which is per perpendicular to the shoreline. And it functions by, uh, by blocking part of the littoral transport, of the longshore transport. So it should cover the entire beach in order to keep working, even during storm surge and very high waves. So this is also one of the, this is one of the drawbacks of the, of the groins, is that it segments uh, the, the beaches. By blocking longshore transport, the groins uh, will work by um, accumulating sand in the updrift area and as a consequence it will cause downstream erosion.
about the drawbacks, there are different drawbacks that are listed here in the in the table. Uh, the, the main one is uh, downdrift erosion, which can be significant, um, and and also the the two D effects it can uh, it can have on the on the currents, because uh, due to the blocking of the longshore current, it will generate eddies um, along the coast, which can be very very dangerous for swimmers uh, near the structure. When we want to design a groin, we have to look at the at, at the width of the of the littoral transport. Depending on the exposure of the of the coast to the forcing waves and currents, the width of the littoral drift is defined. Then the obliqueness of the waves will decide uh, the form of the accumulation because if the if the groin is uh, sufficiently long, the shoreline will tend to reach its equilibrium angle, which is uh, as we've seen in the Q alpha curve defined by the by the wave angle. Then the groin dimension decide on the extent of the interference. This is uh, valid for both sides. It will decide on the extent of the accumulation on the up, up drift part of the of the coast, and also the length of the stretch of coast, which is subject to erosion because of the because of the structure. And then finally, uh, the the number of groins when they are used as a, as part of a groin field, uh, the length the number of groins will also decide on the on the length of the protected area. So here we have uh, very simple uh, simulations to illustrate what happens when, uh, when a groin is constructed along a straight coast. So in the upper figure, we can see that there is no structure. And um, on, the, on the left part, we have uh, slightly oblique waves. So as we've seen before, this is typical from um, stable coasts. So we can see that there is very little movement of the of the shoreline during the during the simulation. And on the right part of the of the slide, we can ha we we have very ob oblique waves, which is associated to an unstable coast, and therefore we can see that the the shoreline is uh, is moving a lot. If the groin is long enough, the accumulation will tend to reach the equilibrium orientation. If, if it's not long enough, uh, the sediment will start uh, bypassing the structure. Then if we have very oblique waves, the problem is that the, this equilibrium orientation is uh, relatively close to the, to the shore normal, which will uh, lead to a shorter stretch of coast protected by this accumulation. In the end, the groins are not so well suited for coasts where we have very oblique waves. Let's have a look at uh, how it how it works when we have a groin field. So as we've seen, the, a single groin causes downstream downstream erosion, and um, therefore, to extend the length of the protected area, uh, we can construct several groins in a row. And when we do that, uh, both the spacing and the length of the groins are uh, are important. So let's have a look at that. So when we have a groin field. The accumulation will start on the on the most updrift groin. So that's illustrated on the on the top two illustrations. Then, if the groins are short enough, they will allow bypass. So before the bypass starts, uh, the development of the coastline between the groin is similar whether it's short or long. But then, when the bypass starts, um, it will start filling the, the gaps that are in between the groins. So that's, uh, that's an important uh, thing to, to have in mind when, uh, when deciding, deciding on the length of the, of the groin. To conclude on the groins, uh, it, the groins are less and less used today because it has significant drawbacks and especially the downstream erosion and also the, the currents created, the dangerous currents created by the by the structure. Uh, on top of that, uh, it obstructs the passage to the to the beach because it has to block the entire uh, the entire beach. 
and uh, and yeah, it's 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 not a very beautiful um, it's not a very beautiful element. However, if a project uh, include gro groins even nowadays, um, usually some filling will be applied in order to avoid the the temporary erosion, and therefore reduce the least side effect of the of the construction. Now we are going to have a look at another common structure to protect against erosion, which is a coastal parallel breakwater. A coastal parallel breakwater is a structure which is parallel to the coast, and it can be located inside or outside the surf zone. By protecting the coast and providing a special shelter for the waves, it will reduce the sediment transport capacity in the, sh in the shelter and therefore uh, cause accumulation. One of the interesting features of the coastal parallel breakwater is that uh, it can also generate accumulation when the, when the waves arrive normal to the coast. This is illustrated on the, on the simulations in the bottom of the slide where we can see that the, the wave field and the wave setup on both sides of the, of the structure will generate uh, circulation which will tend to push sediments toward the toward the lee side of the of the structure but the some of the problems are, are, are there are also some other, some problems such as uh, very strong circulation once again which can co can be an issue for the for the safety of the swimmers and also the the water quality and and the accumulation of of debris in the in the area so let's have a look at how we design this kind of structure. Um, and typically, there are two main parameters we can play with. Uh, it's first the length of the breakwater, and the second parameter is how far from the coast it's located. And this will have a different influence on the, on the evolution of the coastline. So this is a sketch uh, showing how these two parameters can affect the, the evolution of, of the shoreline. There are some other parameters that can influence the, the shape of the accumulation, but this, is, uh, this provides a first estimate. Then when we use uh, coast parallel, coastal pra parallel breakwaters, there are many possibilities. Some protection schemes often use multiple breakwaters. Uh, and here we have an illustration of uh, how this affects the coast. So if we have a singular long coastal breakwaters, we will have a tombolos forming and um, and uh, natural looking uh, long sections of uh, of beach, and this consists uh, in a good protection and and provide good water quality. But the problem is that it it creates permanent tombolos, and therefore the the bypass is very very small. Then if we use uh, segmented breakwater or long coastal breakwaters. We will generate a small, stable pocket beaches, uh, which consist in, in very good protection against erosion. The main problem here is that it's, it's going to have a, a poor aesthetic appearance and they will tend to have a poor quality of, of water and also trap a lot of debris. So, um, and finally, if we have segmented breakwaters of short coastal parallel breakwaters, these breakwaters will generate salience and therefore a nat more naturally looking beaches, but with a poor view because there will be a lot of, of structures located um, not too far in the water. As it doesn't block the sediment transport too much, the erosion in the lee side is, is not as, as large as for uh, tombolos. And also the water quality is, is better and it also have a less tendency to trap debris but it doesn't protect as much as uh, tombolos because the accumulation is is not as as wide in conclusion the breakwaters are able to protect shoreline in more diversified and, and less harmful ways than than the groins moreover the breakwaters uh, can trap sand on the coast with perpendicular wave approach, which is uh, not the case for groin. So it has some advantages that, that the groins uh, don't have. These variations aim at, um, 
at mitigating the the, the disadvantages of the of the breakwaters by by optimizing the shape of the structure. So this is an example of variation where by curving the shape of the breakwater, we'll, we will limit the offshore loss of sand and the lee side erosion by increasing the bypass. A curved breakwater also uh, eliminate the dangerous currents uh, by reducing the, the amount of eddies. And in the case of a, an, an artificial headland or a reef, it has a, a better appearance. And also the, the dry area that is created um, can be useful and used for uh, recreational purposes, for instance. These were the main hard structures. Uh, let's now have a look at the nourishment. By definition, nourishment is done when, when we artificially replace a deficit in sediment budget by, by the corresponding volume of sand. So in the end, it's a relatively natural way to fight against erosion. But the problem is that the, the real cause of erosion is not eliminated. And therefore, it will continue on the nourished area. So nourishments will typically need long-term maintenance. The success of a nourishment depends a lot on the type of sand that is used for nourishing. And we typically uh, try to use sand for nourishments, which is uh, similar or slightly coarser than the, than the natural sand. If the borrow sand is finer, it will tend to form a flatter profile and it will require a lot of sand to have a certain beach width. If the sand is, is coarser than the natural uh, sand, then for the same beach width, it will reach the, the native profile, profile much quicker. There are different ways of nourishing. Uh, these are illustrated here. So it can be land-based operation. It can be uh, pumped uh, from, from the shore. It can be uh, dumped by some uh, large barges or it can be, uh, it can be rainbowed from from the sea and there are also different areas that can be nourished so we as illustrated here we can distinguish uh, three types of nourishment the backshore nourishment which consists in the strengthening of the upper part of the of the of the profile to increase protection uh, of the backshore against erosion and breaching during during the storms we can also have beach nourishment, which is typically used to increase uh, the width of the re recreational area. And we can also have a shore face nourishment, which is uh, which results in a strengthening of the outer part of the profile, usually on the seaside of the of the bar which uh, will typically lead to a, a strengthened profile and also uh, contribute to the to the to the little budget so as the cause of erosion is not treated uh, the sand will leave the area so it's important to have an idea of the lifetime of the nourishment and how long it will take for the sand to leave the area and knowing that will uh, help on will help uh, defining the volume that will be placed. So this is an example of calculation um, that provides a first estimate of the nourishment volume, and it's based on the on the chronic erosion rate, which can be estimated by satellite images, for instance. Obviously, this is a this is a first estimate. Um, because when the when the sand is placed, there will be some other uh, rearrangement that will be that will occur due to the action of the of the waves and the currents. Some other uh, considerations to have are uh, uh, what is the material available. It's not necessarily the case that we'll have a suitable material uh, available nearby. So that's that's also a, a, an important parameter to have in mind. Then what will be the shape of the nourishment? Uh, how is it going to be placed uh, along the beach? And all these are, are considerations that are important when, when designing and, and preparing a, a scheme based on nourishment.
as there are many ways to to protect the coast it's it's not necessarily easy to to select the right one and and uh, and numerical models are a great tool for uh, testing different type of mitigation measures and and test what what will be the effect on the shoreline here you have an example of a, of a coast where uh, we placed a groin in one case a shore parallel breakwater in the, in the in the bottom and and nourishment uh, in the third case and we can see that the numerical model helps us uh, identifying the shoreline response so here we can see that on the groin uh, there is accumulation on one side and erosion on the other side for the shore parallel breakwater it's located in a way that um, a salient is formed but very locally in the third case we have a nourishment that is placed and transport it away from its original location, which means that we'll have to nourish again. So thank you very much. I hope uh, this was a, a useful overview of the different types of, of protection schemes. If you have any questions, feel free to, to contact me. I will spend a bit of time on, on uh, answering the questions that have been uh, asked during the, during the presentation. The next webinar will be held in uh, in two weeks from now. It will be uh, about the principles for designing coastal developments, like like artificial beaches or or harbors, and we will look at uh, at uh, specific examples where um, this principle have been applied for real projects and where these developments have been uh, made in a way to to work with nature. So thank you very much and see you next time.